Amen. All right, there in Matthew 24, look at verse number 29. It says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He shall send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now keep a bulletin or a ribbon here in Matthew 24. We're going to be coming back and forth day quite a bit tonight. But go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 17. Now on Sunday nights we're preaching through our doctrinal statement as a church. And one of the points near at the end here is the end times. We believe in a post-tribulation pre-wrath rapture. We do not believe in a secret pre-tribulation rapture. The rapture takes place after the tribulation but before God pours out His wrath on the earth. So tonight, we're going to break this into several different segments. There's a lot of meat in Revelation and in Daniel. Even in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's a lot of things that are very deep that the Lord reveals to us so we can have an understanding. But a lot of us were raised being taught something different. Or the mainstream mentality is totally different. And so what I want to do is try to help clear it up and make it as simple as possible. And we're going to break it into several sermons. And tonight what I'm going to focus on is really an overview of the timeline. And so one of the things I want to, I want to look at first of all is where... Just kind of make some markers... to where we can have an idea as we, we're going to look through some scriptures I want to help you sort of place them along the timeline. Okay? And you're in, in Matthew 24, if you still have one finger there, take a look at verse number 5. What I want to look at are a few pre-tribulation signs. Okay? There are things that we're going to see before the tribulation of the saints begins. So this is sort of this could be from today moving forward. That's sort of a generic period. I mean, we could have a few years. We could have hundreds of years. We don't exactly know. There are certain things that we know that are like in the days of Noah or in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah that are very big indicators. There are certain things in the technology about the mark of the beast and the, the New World Order, all right, the Illuminati, Freemasonry. There are certain pieces that are in place that would allow the devil, the Antichrist, to work together to set up their kingdom and begin all of this. So we know that we're close just by looking at some of the signs. But I just want to show you a couple in the Bible. Verse 5 in Matthew 24, it says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So there's going to be many false prophets that are gone out into the world, the Bible tells us. There's a lot of New Age spiritualists out there today that would say that I'm, I'm a Christ. I am a type of a Christ. They call this the Christ consciousness. This is a very common teaching throughout the entire world. In verse 6 he says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So there's things that will happen that will begin to happen. A lot of false prophets. There's going to be false Christians. Yeah, that's true. All right, we're going to have we're going to have it talked about wars and rumors of wars. Now you're in Luke 17 and you think about it, you know, are we in the end times right now? A lot of people try to say that because there are so many false religions. There are so many rumors of wars, especially here lately, especially with the political atmosphere that we're in. I mean, World War 3 could start any minute, literally any second, is what I've been hearing for the past decade. Okay, I just, oh, 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 just kidding, false alarm. Yeah, but if Israel, well, if Iran, well, if Russia, well, if Syria, I mean, who's the boogeyman next, right? 
But this is all a ploy. This is the devil starting wars, and then there's rumors of wars. And these are, I think, some indicators that we are getting closer and closer. But just as it says, the end is not yet. In Luke 17, look at this. He says in verse 22, And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here, or see there. Go not after them, nor follow them. Now flip to Luke 21. So there's going to be a strong desire for deliverance. God's people are going to be yearning in their spirit to just get out of here. I mean, you think about how, how Lot was vexed by their filthy conversation from day to day because he was surrounded by a bunch of perverts. Yeah. Well, in the same way, when we go out into the world, when you go shopping with your children yeah. and your soul gets vexed because of the music coming through the speakers, yeah. because of the perverts working the aisle, working in the store, walking around, I mean, as you just get like, oh, people are dressed inappropriately, acting inappropriately, saying things inappropriate, and it doesn't matter. God's, God's, hand, God's not going to judge them. And they, people have this attitude where it sort of makes us willing to depart, you know, ready to go to the Lord. Yeah. And this is one of the other signs that it talks about. Um, there's also going to be a strong deception, a devilish deception. And if you look at the media, if you look at the news, man, it's already happening. Look at Luke, Luke 21, verse 8. It says, Take heed that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near, Go ye not before, therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. So again, it's saying the same thing. It's going to seem like the world is in chaos, but the majority of it is rumors, especially in our side of the world. We don't have wars. We don't have gunfire in the streets. We live in peace for the most part. God has blessed us with the ability to have church and to, to have families and businesses. Now turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So we're going to be desiring for His return. We're going to be dealing with deception. We're going to have a lot of fake Christians and fake Christ, false prophets, fake prophets coming on the scene, trying to deceive people and bewitch people. You know, and witchcraft in, in the mainstream today is very popular. And just as it was in the Old Testament, they mix it with Christianity. Because yeah. that was the problem with the children of Israel in the Old Testament, is they would worship Dagon and Jehovah. Yeah. Right? They would have a statue to one God, and then they would give the Lord God Almighty lip service. They would still go to the temple. They might still tithe. They might still do certain things. And God hated that. Yeah. Because their heart was not for God alone. Therefore, it was not for God at all. Amen. You know, one of the men was talking about a, a church during football season that put out, here we worship God and football. And just how blasphemous that is yeah, because ridiculous. you might as well take off the first part. You're not worshiping God if you're worshiping football. That's, right. That's impossible. And I've, I've seen churches that have, they'll, they'll shut down the Sunday night service. They have a get together. I installed internet in one and they were all about it. They wanted TVs all in this room. They're really big, a big deal. And as I was leaving, I noticed that there was actually a Freemasonic symbol in their cornerstone. Wow. It was a dedicated church. They were all Freemasons. They don't care about the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't care about serving God. And the, the times, the end times, are upon us when you start looking at the witchcraft and what they're doing. You know, in the Hollywood Masonic temple, above the door, it says Freemasonry builds its temples among the nations and in the hearts of men. It's witchcraft, and they're trying to get into your heart. Wow. That right. same facility is one of the primary studios for the Jimmy Kimmel show and a bunch of other TV shows right there in a Freemasonic Hall. How do they get in your heart? Through the music, yeah. through the television. This is how the Antichrist is going to deceive many. Right. And hey, the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. He's already in the world. You're in 2 Thessalonians 2. Look at verse number 1. He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't be deceived that it can come at any moment. And we know that is the most popular view out there, but I believe it really is decreasing. They, when, yeah. when 
Christian colleges and Baptist universities can't even defend this standpoint without going to somebody else that doesn't believe the gospel right? We, it, it's obvious that they've got a problem. They're the ones that are in fear. They're the ones that are flaring, f fleeing. And God's Word is, is evident. It speaks to us and it shows us that as a believer, hey, in the world you will have tribulation. Right? right? Yeah. We have been appointed unto affliction and suffering and tribulation. We will be conformed to the image of Christ. And He went through a lot of stuff and so will we. But God has it for a purpose. It's not so we can have a big house here. Right. It's so we can have one there. Amen. Right. Now look, He says in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So there's going to be a falling away from faith. There's going to be a falling away from God. Right? A falling away from righteousness. This is one of the signs that we will see before the tribulation begins. And you think about it, how many, how many of you have met somebody, whether it's out soul winning or in real life, that would say, yeah, I used to be a Christian. Did I ever spoke to somebody like this? I met a gentleman one time, I, well, I use the word gentleman loosely, but at a, at a libertarian political rally. He was advocating for the Libertarian Party and I was there on other business and we, we sort of started talking and we got into it because, oh, I used to be a Christian. And he had this attitude like, but I'm so much smarter than you now. Oh, I've got it all figured out. I, I'm not, I don't need Christ anymore. I don't need the Bible or God. I've got my own way. And I said, no, you didn't. You, used to, you, weren't, you were not a Christian. You never were a Christian. He never knew you. And the guy started, I've read the Bible like 50 times. And I said, you're lying. If you've read the Bible 50 times, you quote me one verse. <laughs> No John 3.16. No nothing. He couldn't quote anything because God's Spirit's not in his heart. He never was a Christian. So when somebody comes in, when we see this falling away that's going to happen, it's going to be people that are not Christians. Yeah. Maybe they're Facebook Christians, right? right. Oh, I'm a Facebook follower. Yeah, of what? <laughs> of what? Because it's not of God. You know, It's just in, in your status symbol. It's kind of like saying, well, I'm not a, a Mohammedan. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Buddhist. So I'll just put Christian. And, and uh, checking a box does not make you a Christian. That's it's right. believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the only way to be saved. It's the only way to heaven. Amen. We will see this falling away. This is a big indicator. This is a, a big sign we will see of the end times. Now go ahead and go back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. So some pre-trib signs will be fake Christians, rumors of wars, false signs. And not to be confused because there will be a, fall, a false Christ, the Antichrist, but before that we're going to see a buildup of a lot of people claiming to be Christ, claiming to come in my name, as the Bible says, in God's name, but they're not of God at all. So then we're going to take a look next at the tribulation. The Bible calls this the tribulation of the saints. This is what saved people will go through. And there's several terms for it. We're going to look at a couple of them. But I'm going to read you, look at verse 7. We're going to look at some indicators to know when it's happening. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. These, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Right? So famines. There's going to be a lack of food. It's going to be hard to get food. Pestilence, which is what God would use to destroy crops. God would use plagues or pestilences. It says earthquakes. This is another big indicator. There have been a, an increase of earthquakes, but I think what this is, is talking about is earthquakes that cannot be ignored. Earthquakes in places that there shouldn't be earthquakes. That the scientists will say, well, this doesn't make sense. Well, of course, because you don't believe in God. Right. You know, you fool. Look, he says in verse 9, <coughs> and this is in, in the tribulation, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. In, in another passage, we're going to look at it in a second, it talks about family members betraying one another. It reminds me of, of the sermon last night 
We're talking about when you send your children off to the devil's school. You know, the Bible says that your children are like having a quiver full of arrows. Yeah. That's how you fight the enemy. You've got your arrows. Well, when you hand the arrows to the enemy, yeah. then the devil uses it as a fiery dart to shoot you in the back. Yeah. And in the end times during the tribulation, there will be family members that will actually be having people put to death. Amen. Some of us may already have problems with family members. This is going to be at a whole nother level. Yeah. They will be betraying us. Look at verse 11. He says, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now we know in context, let's talk about their life. If your body, you're able to endure through all this tribulation, affliction, persecution, the wrath of the devil, then you survive, then you'll be raptured. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, it says. Look, he says in verse 14, he says, And this gospel, this is one of the most important verses. This is one of the most important indicators of the tribulation. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Amen. When Jesus' disciples asked Him what's going to be the sign, how will we know in the ends here? What will, how, what will we know? I don't think they, that, that soul winning was the answer they were looking for. But that's what God is looking for from His people. Yes, there are going to be, you know, every Christian will probably be affected by the tribulation in some way or another. Even if they never go to church, they're going to have to take a stand because if God's Holy Spirit is in you, something's going to happen. We're going to be confronted with family members, with your doctor, with you know, buying something at the store. We're going to have to cross this line. We're going to have to fight these battles. But not everyone, you know, everyone will be affected that is a Christian, but not everyone will be rewarded because they're not doing the soul winning. They're not preaching this gospel unto every nation like Jesus is saying here. That's why we win souls now. Because when this spiritual warfare gets real, when it gets crazy, we're going to be ready because we're already God's mighty men. We're already God's preachers, both men and women, Amen. that go out daily, weekly, and we proclaim the gospel. Right. The end is coming, and Jesus is using us. He's using us to go out and reconcile men unto right. Him. Amen. Because the timing, there's so many people are worried about the timing, and they're not even saved. Yes, it's, right. it's just, it blows my mind how many people have an opinion on the timing, and they want to draw their charts, and yet they would say they have to stop sinning to go to heaven. Yeah, that's right. Guess what? They're not going to heaven. Right. Okay? Amen. They, with these hyper dispensationalists, they are not going to heaven. They are not Christians. They're not Baptists. I don't care what label they use. When they turn salvation into a work, and they say that God had other people work their way to heaven, you have just perverted the gospel of yes. Jesus Christ. Yes. The gospel of this kingdom, that one day we will have a kingdom, God will rule and reign, and we will be with Him. Now turn to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to look a little bit more about the tribulation. So, it also says they're going to kill us. I'm going to put this on the list. But you know what? The soul winning. In Revelation 6, he says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were. And this should be fulfilled. Right? There are men and women that will die. God knows it. God wants it to happen. And this body doesn't matter. When it comes down to the tribulation, it, it, you know, it's not about this escapism, oh, i got to get out of here. It's about, okay, game on. Mm -hmm. i got to start winning souls. Yeah. Because the devil will be working fast, quickly, to use every power he has through the television, through the internet, mm -hmm. through friends and family, to deceive people in their hearts, to set up a temple in their heart and say, this Antichrist, he is God. Let the devil be your God and you'll have money. You'll have food. You don't have to worry about the famine and the pestilence. He's going to try to afflict people to convince them. Now you're in Revelation 12. Look at verse 9. 
And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So listen, the devil, during the tribulation, he's cast down out of heaven. He comes down to the earth. For what purpose? You see what it says there? Look at verse 11. It says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath because he knoweth that he had but a short time. The devil knows that in the timeline when this happens, when he's cast out of heaven, he has very little time. This time is called the devil's wrath. And his wrath is against Christians. That's why it's called the, tri the tribulation of the saints. And there's a lot of details I'm going to skim over because we're going to go in very much depth in the tribulation and then separately into the wrath and then also into the millennium. So if there's, if there's questions you have and you want to ask me, that's fine after the service. But right now I want to focus on the major points of this section, okay? Now turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. So the wrath of the devil is the tribulation of the saints. It is not the full seven year period. It is three and a half years, 1260 days, time, times, and half a time. In Daniel 7 verse 21, he says, I beheld... And the same horn, which is, he said, made war with the saints. Right? War with the saints. The tribulation of the saints. And prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until times Time, times, and the dividing of time. So in other words, there's your three and a half year period. And now when it says change the laws, I've heard a lot of men over the years say oh, they're going to make it illegal to have a Bible. And that may be true, but you know, there's so many fake Bibles out there. You know, The devil doesn't really have to make it illegal to have a Bible. All he has to do is make it popular to have the wrong Bible. Right, sure. And he can be just as successful. Right. You know, but what I think the laws that will be changed, because it says they're going to hate us, Right? Today they accuse us of hate speech when we say hell is real. And if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell. They, they accuse us of hate speech when we say that sodomites are child molesters and we don't want them in our church. They hate us for saying that. And I think some of the content of the Bible about hell, about public preaching, about door knocking, these are the things they'll probably make illegal. They may try to make it illegal to hold a church. They may try to make it illegal to even have a Bible. But like I said, if all the devil has to do is get a bunch of fake Bibles out there and water it down. Yeah. Because like we said, you know, there, there's going to be a falling away first. We're going to see so many fake Christians and they're going to lead a multitude to do evil. You're in Matthew chapter 10. Look at verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. The Lord doesn't want us wrestling with flesh and blood. Okay? If anybody comes in this church and says, I got a, I got a way we're going to get back at the government, we need to run them out of here. Okay? We are not here about trying to fight the government with fists and our bullets and things like that. That doesn't make sense. That's, that's just total foolishness. That's right. I mean, the people that I'm going to store up a bunch of ammo and you can come take it for me. Yeah, okay, they'll just send a cruise missile to your front door, <laughs> right? Or Patriot missile or, you know, I mean, really, what do they need? I mean, why would they want to have a standoff with you when they can just push a button and watch you burn? You know what I mean? And listen, this is not what God wants from us. That is the spirit of fear. We cannot fight the government by filling out a special document and giving ourselves a special title. Okay? We can't fight the government by storing up on ammo. 
or stocking up on food. And listen, there's nothing wrong with being prepared for what might happen, but when that becomes your primary focus out of a spirit of fear, you've already lost. The devil has got you. Look, he says in verse 17, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up into councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Go back to Matthew 24. Take no thought. If, if the devil persecutes you, if you get in a situation, it's not about I know what I'll tell them. It's like, I know God's going to give me something. I trust the Lord. I have confidence in the Lord. His Spirit will work through me. And this is the confidence that God wants us to have. Amen. Now, with this, we have a few other things on the timeline. It mentioned a judgment. We're not going to get into that tonight. We have the Antichrist coming. We have the resurrection. We're going to look at the Antichrist and the abomination of desolation. Okay, The abomination of desolation is one of the last little things. I don't have a lot of space here. But in Matthew 24, look at... well. Before I read that, let me read this to you. In Daniel 11 it says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. That's us. God wants us to do exploits and show the wickedness of the devil's works. We need to fight back. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and spoil many days. Hey, and you know what? Physically, we're going to lose lives. Yeah. And that's okay. Because spiritually, we've already won. Right. Our Amen. soul is sealed unto the yeah, day of good. redemption. Right. Whether our body's here, whether our soul's there, right. it's sealed by the Lord God Almighty. That's right. You're in Matthew 24, look at verse 15. He says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let them which be on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Alright, this doesn't mean stop having kids now out of fear. I've seen people that have this, oh, woe unto you. We don't have a bunch of kids. No. We're supposed to have kids. That's a blessing of God. We're supposed to lead them and teach them and warn them of things to come. We're supposed to prepare them spiritually even for this. But pray ye that your flight be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor shall ever be. Now turn to Luke 21. So at the end of the period of the tribulation, it's really going to ramp up. There's going to be the great tribulation. It's going to get very heated. Yeah. In Daniel 11, what it was re referring to here, he says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. I'm sorry, you're in Luke 21. I read ahead here. So you're in Luke 21. Look at verse 20. That's what I just read for you. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So when Daniel warned us about the abomination of desolation, and he gives us a timeline of the things to come, and we know that there's a resurrection in between there, what's going to happen is right there at the end of it, we're going to see Jerusalem encompassed with armies. This parallel is where in Matthew 24, where it said the abomination of desolation, in Luke 21, it tells us Jerusalem encompassed with armies. Jerusalem will be desolate. It, Jerusalem is... It's, it's funny because for the past thousands of years, people have been fighting over Jerusalem yeah. for political control and religious control. And yet God has a plan for it. And God doesn't want to rule from 
some filthy city on a bunch of dirty blocks, yeah. right? God's going to make all things new. Yeah, right. And people don't understand that. In the Bible, the word Holy Land is only used one time, and it's talking about when the Lord is there and He's ruling, when yeah. He heals the earth. That hasn't happened yet. There's nothing holy about that land, about that dirt over there, yeah. right? Look, He says in verse 21, Then let them which be, are in Judea flee to the mountains, and them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Now go back to Matthew 24. So, the ending of the tribulation. How we know when we're about to the point of the resurrection is when we see the abomination of desolation, Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Jerusalem is partially destroyed and then it's totally destroyed. There's a series of events that take place. And look at Matthew 24, verse 29. This is where we started. It says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then, sh then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Yep. He came first as a baby. He comes next, resurrecting the saints. Look at what he says. He says, and, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now turn to 1 Thessalonians 4. So we're going to see the sun darken, the moon, the stars. I don't have a lot of room here. I'm going to do my best to draw those for you. Like I said, I'm not going into great detail on any of these sections. I will go into much greater detail here and also here. What I want to do is give you an idea, a walk through all the way through without stopping too deep on anything. Now in Daniel 7 he says, And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as a snow. And the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Now you're in 1 Thessalonians 4. Look at verse 13. He says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Hey, if you have a saved family member, they're asleep in Jesus. Don't be sorry for them. Hey, they're somewhere we wish we could be, right? They beat us home. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So what he's saying here is, the, the saints that are already dead, your family members that are Christians that are already dead, we're going to see them come first with Jesus, and then we will actually be resurrected. There's a, there's a spacing there. And again, it calls it the coming of the Lord. Yeah. It's very clear in the Bible that the coming of the Lord is the return of Christ. It's the resurrection of the saints. 1 Corinthians 15 gives us great detail about that. We're going to be looking at that in one of the next sermons. Now we're going to look at the time that the Bible calls the wrath. And it calls it the wrath of God. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. In Joel 2, verse 30, he says, I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible 
day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant who the Lord shall call. So God's telling us that the day of the Lord is going to be a terrible thing, right? Yeah. For us, it'll be a glorious thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, it'll be awesome. But for the rest of the earth, it's going to be terrible mm -hmm. to go through the wrath of God. Yep. You think the wrath of the devil was something? Mm -hmm. You wait till you see the wrath of God. Yeah, God right. does some amazing things to the earth. And it still survives. But that's all part of God's plan. In Revelation 15, 1, he says, And I saw another sign in heaven, having great and marvelous, I'm sorry, great and marvelous, seven angels having the last seven plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. God has things reserved in store for those that don't love Him, right. but the things He has for us is so much more amazing. Right. We're not even going to be able to comprehend it. You're in Revelation 8. Look at verse 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And a third part of the ships were destroyed. Can you imagine this earth surviving with a third part of the sea being destroyed? Can you imagine just how much devastation? I mean, we eat a lot of fish, a lot of the creatures, a lot of our food sources, and there were already plagues that happened. So this gonna food, good food especially, will be very scarce. Mm -hmm. We might find ourselves well, we won't be here for this part, but imagine, I mean, you'd be eating bark or whatever you can get a hold of at this point because there's very little nutrition. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and on the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So, get, so the waters become poison, and it begins to kill people. And maybe it's like fluoride or something, only worse, right? Yeah. <laughs> he says, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Imagine, even after the plants are destroyed, what plants remain are only getting, you know, they're getting a third less sunlight than they need. So now things will stop flourishing. The whole earth is slowly becoming to a halt as the Lord, one thing after another, begins to pour out His wrath on the Antichrist, on His kingdom. And it comes to a head at, at Armageddon. It comes to a point where there's a mighty war where, where God destroys a lot of the wicked people. And I beheld and, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by the reason of the other voices of the trumpet of three angels which are yet to sound. Even after all this, he's like, wait till you see what God has next. Yeah. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel 47. So in the time of God's wrath, He'll take it from the Antichrist. It comes to a head. And with all this, the Lord ultimately is going to set up His kingdom. I want to talk about the kingdom a little bit. The Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of information about the kingdom, but it, it does in a whole lot of places, actually. Psalms talks about things about it. Meek inheriting the earth. What's it mean, inherit the earth? I don't want this old rotten earth. I thought my treasure was in heaven, right? But there are things that, that are going to happen in God's kingdom where once the devil pours out his wrath, then God pours out his wrath, the Lord Jesus Christ will reign on earth. In Daniel chapter 7, it says, And there was given him a dominion, and a glory, and a kingdom that all people, nations, and language, languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. In His kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. 
So in Daniel, it's, it's telling us about how when the Lord comes back, it's going to be like no other kingdom that's ever existed. It's going to be amazing. In another part, it talks about a child living to be 100 years old. God is going to, there won't be death and disease and sorrow. Things will change, but yet there will be human beings just like we are now that make it through all of this that live in the kingdom, and yet we will be ruling and reigning with Him over this kingdom. In this kingdom, it also tells us that there will be seven women to one man. That tells us that the majority of the men die through the tribulation and the wrath. I think a lot of the children survive through. And of those seven women, they say to that one man, they say, let us be called by thy name. Only take away our affliction. What they're saying is, marry me. He said, and, they, and they say, I'll, I'll, I'll feed myself. I'll, I'll clothe myself. But I want to have children. And the Bible actually tells us that, that the, the earth will be replenished. It talks about great multitudes of people that will live during the kingdom. This isn't just going to be a handful of people. There will be a population explosion like there's never been. There will be no abortion. There will be no birth control. There will be no pesticides, no GMO, right? God will be ruling and reigning. He will, he will give us a glimpse of what He wanted all the way back over here in the Garden of Eden. Just a small glimpse. Now, it won't be identical or anything. In Isaiah 11, He says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. These animals are not going to hurt children. These animals are not going to be hurting each other because the Lord will be reigning and He will have peace on the earth. Yes. And the, the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The lion will not be a meat eater. God's going to make it eat straw. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. Can you imagine if you walk over and your baby's playing in a snake pit? It's like, oh, he's just got a snake. No, no big deal. God's, got, God's protecting. Isn't that cool? I mean, you think about how much fun it would actually be to play with a snake, right? If it wasn't for that. If it wasn't for the curse that's on our earth right now. In Isaiah 2 it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and He will teach us of His ways, and we will walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and from the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So in Jerusalem where the Lord reigns, you could say you have Zion, New Jerusalem, got the mountain of the Lord's house established above the mountaintops. He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. They're going to take their weapons and turn them into things to gather food. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now you're in Ezekiel 47. Look at verse number 1. Afterward, he brought me... And, and Ezekiel, just a little, a little back story here. Ezekiel 40, it begins to tell us about the mountain of the Lord's house. It begins to tell us about how the Lord will build His temple and how it looks and how the tribes will be allotted in Zion and in Jerusalem. He gives very intricate descriptions. And in look at verse 1. He says, Afterward, he brought me again to the door of the house. And behold... Waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Now, this is a little bit confusing. I don't, I don't want to get too deep here. I don't want to get your mind off track about which side it's on or anything like that. What I want you to focus on here is that the Lord, in His throne, in His house, He has waters that begin to come out. And what do these waters do? It says in verse 3, it says, And when the man that had the line in his hand, this is, the guy, this is the guy leading Ezekiel, showing him this vision. He has a measuring stick. He says he had the line in his hand, went forth eastward. He measured a thousand cubits. Here's a cubit, right? 18 inches. He's got this stick. And this, he's measuring this river to see how big it is. He measures a thousand cubits. He's taking Ezekiel with him in the spirit. He says... He measured a thousand cubits and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. 
So after a thousand cubits, it's just ankle deep. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters and the waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through and the waters were to the loins. Afterward, he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass over for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. So in other words, he's saying there's a river coming out of God's throne, out of God's mountain, and it's so big that a man cannot swim across it. He makes him measure it to understand, to comprehend just how big it is. Well, what is this river? What's the point of this river? He says in verse 6, he says, And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, at the brink of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country, and go down into the desert, and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. This is the river of life. This is God, after all the destruction, beginning to heal the earth. He says, wherever these waters go, it's going to heal the earth. Look at verse 9, And it shall come to pass, that everything that liveth, which moveth, Whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither. For they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Engedi even unto Eglium. And it shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, and the fish of the great sea exceeding many. So remember, all, everything was poisoned. There was, you know, there was all this damage on the earth and now the Lord is showing His great and mighty hand and His yes. love toward human people Amen. by restoring the earth and healing everything. But the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. And by the river, look at verse 12. This is very interesting. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that shall grow all trees for meat whose leaf shall not fade neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. This is the tree of life. It's giving fruit by the months. It's for healing of the nations. And it's going to sustain life. Now turn to Revelation 21. So in the kingdom, God will heal there will be peace. There's the tree of life. There's the river of life. And this is just a glimpse of dwelling with the Lord. What we see when we get to the new earth, I don't think this body or this mind can even comprehend. Yeah. In 1 Corinthians 15, it tells us that there are bodies terrestrial. I'm a terrain. I'm on the terrain. My feet are on the ground, right? And it says there are bodies celestial. Just as the Lord Jesus Christ, when He was resurrected, had a supernatural body. He didn't have blood in His veins. He could walk through walls. He could disappear. I think we're going to be similar in that aspect. And so a world fit for beings made like that. It would be very interesting. Very cool. And the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about that. Because like I said, I don't think we could even understand it. You're moving toward Revelation 21. Look at verse 10. And He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain. Remember the mountain we talked about? And showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, on the other side, and on the either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Word for word, exactly what we saw in Ezekiel 47. And this is how the Lord will restore the earth during, during His kingdom. Now look at Revelation 20. Take a step back. At the end of this, there's going to be a little season. 
And this is where the devil will have one last chance. And this is how the devil will go and deceive the nations. In Daniel 7, he tells us about it also. He says, as concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. There's a little season at the end of all of this where God will yet again prove mankind. He'll give them an opportunity. In Revelation 20, where you're at, look at verse number 7. It says, And when the thousand years were expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to declare the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So I believe that we will rule and reign over the earth territorially as the Lord sees fit. Some of us may be kings and priests right here in Jacksonville, Florida in the millennium, in the thousand years. And yet when the devil is loosed for a little season, he deceives the nations, he gets them to go against God, and then it says that we are in camp. We go back, basically, we all retreat back to the kingdom. And it's not that we're running in fear, but this is just part of God's bigger picture. In another part of the Bible, it says that the earth, the heaven and the earth fled away. There was no place found for them. God will ultimately have judgment where He destroys everything. Look at, well, just stay where you're at there. We're almost done here. In Daniel 7, it, talking about this judgment, there is, there is a last judgment. He says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought Him near before Him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is that which shall not be destroyed. You're in Revelation 20, look at verse 11. And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was, no, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So as all of this plays out, there's a final judgment, there's a lake of fire, which will be the final resting place for everybody that comes out of hell that's judged. Yeah. They wind up in the lake of fire. Right. Now, when heaven and earth pass away, everything on the earth passes away, the, tri the saints are with God in His mountain, right? In His house. Right In my house are many mansions. We are built up like lively stones. Right, The anchor of our soul is with the Lord. So we will be with the Lord as earth disappears and the heaven disappears. And when it says heaven, I believe it means all of the heavens. The Bible teaches us in Genesis 1, in the beginning was the heaven and the earth. If your Bible says heavens, plural, it's wrong, throw it away. Because later God creates the heavens, our atmosphere and our sky, the heavens, the cosmos or the stars. It was on the first day that he created the heaven, his dwelling place. The Bible calls it the third heaven. And God created it on the first day and I believe he destroys it on the last day because moving forward, we were with him. Now he's going to create all things new. He will create a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. God himself will create a new dwelling place for himself and a new dwelling place for us. Now, all these things, they are very deep. There's a lot of little things, little, little details I've left out, but I intend to try to cover them in greater detail, but yet make it consumable. Make it something to where it's just not overwhelming because this is a very big subject. But God has given us this information for revelation. He has revealed it to us to comfort us, to help us understand. And the most important thing, if there's one thing I could have you to remember from all of this, Number one, as Christians go through the tribulation, He wants us to be soul winners. Amen. That's right. This is our primary purpose. Yeah, that's right. This is why we're on the earth now. Look, 
We were not appointed unto God's wrath. We will see the wrath of the devil. Mm -hmm. And if we're alive when this happens, be prepared to be a soul winner. Amen. Be prepared to lay down your life. Amen. And if it's not in our generation, but it's in our children's generation, then you need to take a serious attitude now of teaching them and warning them of the mark of the beast right. and the Antichrist and the end times and tell them that they need to be soul winners even if their life matters. Even if they lose their life over it. Yeah, that's right. Right. Brother Nate was threatened with harm today. Threatened to have the cops called on him for knocking on a lady's door because he just wanted to preach the gospel to her. And she was so mad when she called me. But Nate, praise the Lord you didn't back down. Amen. I wish we'd all have that attitude. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the book of Revelation and Matthew and Daniel. And Lord, I just pray You would help us all to be able to have a better understanding